Okay. So the plan is today to uh, promote all the um, uh, API versions from alpha one to beta one. Uh, the um, source and customize APIs will be V1 beta one and the Helm release API will be V2 beta beta one. Uh, that's why I didn't say V1 beta one everywhere. I <laughs> just said beta. <laughs> yeah, um, I saw that you are removing the alpha definitions. What, is, what does that mean? So that means we don't um, do a, we don't implement a um, conversion webhook inside okay. all the controllers. Uh, there are serious breaking changes, and I think it will be like a, <laughs> for some fields we just couldn't do it. So from now on, we have to be careful. Like uh, for the uh, going forward for the beta versions, we'll have to implement um, conversion webhooks. If we are going to do uh, serious changes, but if we are only going to add uh, optional fields from this moment on, or because we have drop support for Kubernetes 1.15, we, um, the toolkit only works with uh, 1.16 and forward, mm -hmm. uh, we can make use of the default um, annotation for custom resource definitions. So even if we add, uh, let's say, a required field, but that required field, we can uh, set the same default. We don't have to implement a conversion webhook and set the default there. This was uh, a thing that you had to do for 115 because there was no way to tell the API, hey, if someone creates a custom resource, it doesn't have that field set this value in, so you had to do it with Go code. Now you can do it with just uh, through the custom resource definition, there is a default field. So for example, if we add a, I don't know, a provider a field to some spec um, and throughout the API, we now have a generic provider for most things like receivers uh, and other stuff. Uh, we can set that generic provider as the default. So, um, that should be automatically upgraded. No need for conversion webhooks. Um, there is some complication that comes with implementing conversion webhooks because you need to set up uh, TLS and you need to approve the certificate with the, sign the certificate with the Kubernetes CA. Uh, <laughs> That's all the stuff that Kube Builder sort of includes by default unless you tell it not to, isn't it? Whole bunch yeah. And Q, yeah, but QBuilder also comes with uh, definitions for creating uh, certificates with uh, uh, cert manager, cert manager patches the object. So when you apply them again, you'll undo the patch. It's not friendly. <laughs> so yeah, it's a it's a major complication for us. Uh, well, at some point we'll have to do it. I'm guessing until we reach V1, we'll make some breaking change or we'll do something that needs a conversion webhook and we can deal with that then. Uh, but yeah, the, the idea is for the beta versions uh, add optional fields. We kind of have a pretty uh, stable API regarding the um, fields. Like for example, I know git URL uh, or uh, customization path. We don't have many of those required fields, but I don't expect them to change in the future. What about the, I thought the impersonation and you want to change that. Okay. Hide, can you mute? Um, so the impersonation stuff, we have impersonation implemented in a customized controller in the customization API by allowing a cluster admin to specify service account and 
the reconciliation runs under that uh, particular service account. And this approach is okay if you um, limit the, the customized watch to the admin namespace. Once you let anyone specifying customizations and Git repositories in their own namespaces, then we can no longer use a service account because they can create a pod with that particular service account and so on. Uh, and for that, what we decided to do for that use case where we allow tenants to create uh, their own Git repository customization hand releases, whatever, we will use um, um, a Kubernetes user that sits under the GOTK group. And uh, using a user, then you can no longer uh, run a pod under that user because you can run pods on, only under service accounts. And this is not a change in the API because uh, this is a, a, a flag. When you do a GOTK install or bootstrap, you say, multi-tenancy minus minus multi-tenancy true. And once you set that, all the controllers um, that are doing reconciliation, uh, if they are uh, reconciling something that's not in the same namespace as the controller, they will automatically uh, impersonate that particular user. If the user is not there, it will tell you, hey, you have to create this user, uh, you have to bind it. And we have a helper function in the account name. What? Will it ignore any yeah. service account name? Yeah, ignores everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just superficially, that's not a great API, thinking about it, like having things right. ignored. What? I see, I see why using users is, sorry, using service accounts as a security hole, but also having things in your API that get ignored and depending on a flag that you haven't set yourself is a bit weird. Yeah, uh, what we uh, we should do, I, I wrote this up somewhere in a discussion, we should um, deliver um, gatekeeper uh, legal rules. And for example, uh, you could have a, a, a rule in Gatekeeper that say, hey, if the namespace uh, is not the, uh, the admin namespace, we don't allow you to specify a service account. Then we reject that customization. So the user has instant feedback. Hey, I'm not allowed to set a, a service account. I cannot impersonate anyone. The impersonation is, is done uh, automatically. Um, I think that's a better approach than just ignore a field, <laughs> reject the custom resource because they are trying to set uh, impersonation when they are not allowed to. And also other things like maybe we don't want uh, to allow tenants to refer sources from other namespaces. And this is um, yet another use case for Gatekeeper where you can say um, a customization or hand release in the source ref, the namespace has to be uh, equal to the uh, release object or not set. If it's not, then you reject that because it means that uh, a user is trying to um, you know, uh, pull uh, sources from other tenants. Uh, in theory, they don't know about those sources, but maybe they can guess it. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, with, with Gatekeeper, we can um, at least provide some uh, guidance on how you can further uh, restrict uh, the API usage. It, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, for, for cluster admins, they want to do stuff like targeting a namespace from their own namespace. They want to set up service accounts. They want to do all this stuff because it gives, a, gives them that power. But um, on the other hand, tenants shouldn't be allowed to do that. So instead of, we, we can ignore fields, but we should have something that rejects that particular object instead of ignoring it. Yes, maybe you could have an admission controller. I mean, 
you don't need to resort to VPA. Um, what? Why do you just not stop tenants creating their own customizations and or Git repositories? Like if you've got a multi-tenant situation, then you might expect that the people, the platform team should be doing the onboarding of things. Um, so there are, uh, that was my initial idea. Yeah. And right. this is now uh, fully supported with the watch uh, flag when you install it. You say watch only space is false. And then even if they create Git repositories and customizations, no one will reconcile them. Mm -hmm. So um, that's uh, that's the current the current way of doing multi tenancy with the toolkit, right? You install it; uh, it only watches a single namespace. Only the admins have a right there, and all the other tenants have to open pull requests on the fleet repository and say, "Hey, I want to add my app repo, and I want to reconcile it in this way." Right, and uh, uh, cluster admin can say, "Okay, uh, I've pro I I have provisioned a, a service account for you. I will give you the service account, and you we'll run it under that service account." And this work works great if the teams are part of the same organization. Now, I've talked to several people about um, the multi-tenancy uh, thing, uh, and there are like two use cases for multi-tenancy. One where you do multi-tenancy for your organization and the, the thing that we have right now works great. Uh, cluster admins validate sources, uh, uh, define service account for each tenant. But there is a different use case where um, you are a service provider to different organizations. And uh, the... Um, the main problem here was that you leak information. For example, uh, if two different organizations share the same cluster, then they will see each other's um, repos. And a couple of people said that's private information. Uh, you shouldn't be able to, to see repos. Well, to open a pull request, you'll see the whole repository. So you'll see that all tenants, what Git repositories they have registered there. Oh, what just, they have yet. So it was for you to onboard your own thing, and therefore you have to open a pull request. OK, but that's not the only possible workflow, right? I mean, yeah, and the, yeah. other things would make it more difficult. Like you send an email to the admin saying where your Git repo is or something. Mm. People can build their own UIs for that. Yeah, but yeah, anyway, um, I think giving um, tenants the power to um, register their own sources, um, define how uh, they want to be reconciled, uh, works great if, because it, in a way, the cluster admins, the platform uh, admin, has less work to do. What a platform handling needs to do is only provision namespaces with that particular user. And afterward, they don't have to worry. They don't have to approve pull requests and so on. Tenants will manage their own sources, but they are restricted in the way that the platform admin uh, makes those users. Um, let me you say that you can refer to a source that's in a different namespace. Or was I misunderstanding? Something, it's just something you said in passing earlier. Yeah, you can refer sources across namespaces. Um, because in the first, uh, um, maybe you want to uh, to have um, shared Git repositories. Maybe you have a namespace for that. You, you keep there all your source definitions. Um, there are a lot of use cases where you want to share um, across namespaces, sources. So all the other, um, all the other things about sources uh, tend to encourage you to have multiple definitions of Git repositories. <laughs> yeah, pointing out the same thing. So why why does this one matter? I mean, just have multiple definitions, right? 
yeah, I mean, for example, um, you would put a lot of pressure on the on the Git server, and if you don't, I don't know, if you have a GitLab on prem and runs on a VM, you could DDoS it. I don't know. Uh, um, that's why you have the buckets in a way to to be able to cache all of that. Yeah, i I'm, I'm. I guess we can uh, we can create this gatekeeper regal rules that are pretty simple to write, where you can yeah deny across namespace references, deny service accounts, uh, and all this stuff. Let Let me share my screen one second. I've created a presentation for this. Okay, so I've defined two roles. One is the platform admin. Um, what the platform uh, admin does, it, its main role is to manage cluster-wide resources. For example, CRDs, controller, and cluster roles. Um, and it also onboards um, the tenant's main repository, or it onboards every single app repository and customization based on how you want to uh, set up your uh, your multi-tenancy. Um, so this is the single tenancy multi-app. Here, an app is a tenant uh, because you have several app repositories that can uh, have a um, a deployment um, made with customize, with plain YAMLs, with Helm charts. Then you have uh, this central repository called the fleet repository, where you onboard all the apps uh, repos. So you create a Git repo for each app, and uh, then and that you place that in the base um, directory. Then for each uh, cluster, uh, you will be um, you'll have an overlay for, for the Git repos, for example. On the staging, maybe you want to synchronize with the staging branch. And on production, maybe you want to do somewhere. And of course, you can do all sorts of customizations here with overlays, change the Helm release values, maybe set up other I don't know, DNS um, resources, and so on. And in, in this model, uh, when someone from the dev team for tenant wants to uh, onboard the new app repo. It has to create a pull request on the fleet repository. So it has to collaborate with the operations team with the, uh, with the cluster admins. And this is what we support today. The they're in charge of onboarding. What? The, um, the earlier slide said that the platform admins were, were in charge of onboarding. So yeah, you have to go through them to add your Git repo and so on into a cluster. Yeah, the the flow here will be someone that you know is a maintainer of the of an app repository wants to onboard the app on on your fleet. It will open a pull request. It will add the Git repo customization or uh, maybe a Helm uh, repository and a Helm release. And the cluster admins will have to approve that. Maybe assign a service account. Uh, for those, so it runs under um, restricted access when it does the reconciliation. Then it merges that in the fleet repo, and the clusters, the fleet of clusters, will will detect that new app and will deploy the app. So this is what we currently support. Um, now around onboarding, so you can onboard something that an app that has the uh, uh, customization uh, base and overlays inside the app repository. This is something, for example, that uh, many uh, many controllers are doing this. Like you have the config directory, and in there you have your base, you have your overlays. And in the fleet repository, you'll just reference uh, that Git repo, and with the customization object, you'll reference one of the overlays. Um, you can also onboard, let's say, app repositories that only have some base deployment um, um, directory, like Flux does. And um, that means that 
directory is not, a, you cannot actually deploy the app by just applying that directory. You have to do modifications. You have to set things up. So here you can use kept. You can um, pull the package inside the fleet repo with with uh, with a kept command. Then you can create overlays, take the base and add secrets, uh, DNS records, whatever you need for that app to be uh, deployable on on your fleet. Or another option here, instead of using customize and overlays in your fleet repo, you can uh, use uh, I don't know, kept alone and create for okay. each uh, cluster a different package, right? And customize it differently with kept alone. And the third onboarding option is with Helm. So in your there is no link directly to the app repository in the fleet repository. The fleet repository reference the Helm repository where the CI uh, of the app publishes uh, chart versions. And uh, you can um, have a different uh, Helm releases per uh, cluster, or you can still use here uh, the same approach as in, in the first uh, option where you can create overlays and modify Helm releases uh, based on each cluster. So there are many options on how you can onboard an application inside the fleet repo. What all, all this stuff means that the cluster admin has to approve all these changes, has to be aware of those. So there is a lot of work for the platform team. Uh, now, based on user feedback, I, I come to a different setup that we want to enable in the future, not in the 01 release, but maybe in 02, where you, let's say you break the fleet repository into multiple things. So each tenant will have its own repo, and in there they will register their their own apps with Git repos, with Helm, with Kept, with all the things that I mentioned before. And what the um, cluster admin is doing, it has to onboard the single repository, the tenant repository, and then it's up to the tenant itself to add, remove apps uh, to the fleet cluster, and so on. Uh, what the uh, cluster admin has to do, it has to create uh, this tenant concept. And the tenant concept is just a namespace definition and a role-based access thing that uh, binds the GOTK user for this particular tenant to a, a role inside a namespace. Or it does a cluster role binding and allows the tenant to uh, um, I don't know, reconcile on multiple namespaces. Right, it's not just a tenant equals a namespace here. You can say there is in the GOTK CLI is a GOTK create tenant with namespace and you can give it several namespaces. Um, and that's about it. From that moment on, the, uh, the platform team doesn't have to, you know, um, every time an app is added or removed or something like that, they, they don't care. Um, yeah, this is uh, something, if I'm understanding right, this is something I arrived at as well, that you can do onboarding by just having a direct link. We, we will refer to your app configs directly in a, from our fleet repo. Or you can delegate that by saying, we will refer to a tenant repo, which refers to the app config. Yeah. And then by yeah. doing that, then people have control over the app yeah. going and so on. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in this use case, our service account approach doesn't work. Right. Uh, and here we, we have to implement the, the user impersonation instead of a service account for this particular use case. And when we try to do that, we find the we found the bug in client go in kubectl in Kubernetes itself. Uh, and Lee is um, fixing that upstream uh, and afterwards you'll be able to do a user impersonation um, so with client go and keep cattle. Problem with service accounts that, is it something like if you just leave it to the default, then you will end up running in the service account of what the thing that's applying uh, the controller? 
And impersonation works because I've implemented uh, impersonation on service accounts based on tokens, and that works. <laughs> uh, a user doesn't have a token. And uh, QCATL as minus minus the username, it fails when it runs in cluster. There is a problem in, in QCATL itself and Clan Go. So we are, we are fixing that. Lee found a solution to fix it. And once we have that fixed, we can implement this, uh, um, let's say, more flexible version of multi-tenancy that allows this kind of, uh, of setup. It's its own, if you name a service account, then it has to exist in your namespace uh, for it to work. So this does this only come up as a problem if you don't name a service account? So the user, uh, the user impersonation, how it works, you don't create a user. You create a role binding for a group, a virtual group called GOTK, and the user is reconciler. Yes. And that's yeah. it. Where is the security hole in the service? When you, when you reconcile, yeah. let's say, a pod definition, you can set in the pod definition the service account if you know the name and you know it because you can do QCATL get service accounts and you can run the pod under that service account and it, Kubernetes will allow that because the service account, when it creates something, it is allowed to create something under its own identity. Yeah. If you don't specify it, then it goes to the default service account of that namespace and default has no, uh, um, no access to anything. But you can say uh, GOTK reconciler as the service account and it will work. And that pod from that moment on will have full access to the namespace. And that's if you... Um if you were able to be syncing stuff into the system namespace. So if you can't sync stuff into the system namespace. So does this arise if you have the situation where you are, you are delegating to uh, a thing, but it's still running in the system namespace? Yeah. Okay, okay I think I understand that, all right. So that, so basically, it's just because if you're running in the system namespace and you get to create anything you want, then you can refer to the a service account in the system namespace. Yeah. And if you're the platform team, why can you not restrict um, the sync so it can't create stuff in the, in the system namespace? As in, so if I understand it, the situation is you are delegating to the tenant repo, which has Git repositories and customization mm. options. Yeah. But the um, you have made a customization which will sync that thing. So for your customization, you could say, uh, please run under a service account that can't create things outside the namespace. And if those things in the tenant repo only get created inside their namespace, then they can only refer to a service account in that namespace. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, that's fine. So in that use case, we, we don't have an issue. <laughs> So there is a, an edge case where you can take over the service account, and that's only in the GOTK system namespace. That's yeah. The problem is there. Should the shouldn't you just advise people not to do that? <laughs> like, yeah, of course we do that, but an yeah. advice is an advice. You have to enforce it some way. <laughs> and sure, I'm just thinking that is a that's sort of a lot simpler than having a whole parallel system where you use users. Um, and I wonder um, if safeguard. Yeah. 
I like the uh, the user approach uh, because it's um, you don't need to create um, a cryptographic identity. And a cryptographic identity like the service account token is expensive. Um, the more namespaces you have, the more uh, uh, service accounts you have to create. When you boot up a cluster, it can take a very long time to provision it. Um, the more service accounts you have, the, the longer it will take. And having users, that means basically nothing because it's just a role binding. You don't create the uh, uh, certs. You don't have to rotate those certs every uh, now and then and all that stuff. So it's, it's less... Um, Okay. Yeah, the impact on, on a cluster bootstrap. You could say um, for the customization that are delegating to the tenant repo, you could say use this user rather than use a service account. Yeah. And, and that, um, you can still get the effect of limiting them to the namespace, which closes that security hole. But you don't, but their customizations will still be respected if they use different service accounts in their own namespace, that will be respected. Yeah. The workloads that get deployed from that customization can use service accounts, not the customization itself. No, what I mean is, um, so the security hole comes about because uh, if you're delegating to a tenant repo and they can create things in the system account, then they can refer to a service account in the system account. Right. So. To close that, you want to say, as part of my delegation, you can't create stuff outside your namespace. Yeah. So that that customization that's doing the delegation, that is syncing the tenant repo, which has its own app definitions and stuff, that can run under a user account, which yeah. doesn't have that is provisioned by the platform team. That delegation. Yeah. Yeah. So that's under control of the platform team. So once it's done that delegation, and the, if the tenant repo can't create stuff outside its own namespace, then it does. It no longer has access to the system namespace and that loophole. So you can just go back to honoring the service account name delegation as before, because they can't access the service the system account anyway. You don't have to have a thing where sometimes the um, sometimes the impersonation will be honored and sometimes it won't be. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You can um, so you can create <clears throat> this um, another option that I've used for um, for the WeWork stuff um, is creating the service account in the system namespace create a cluster role binding for that service account to the tenant namespace, and you run the customization under that service account, which is not in a tenant namespace. That service account is in the system namespace, and it only has access only to has the access. tenant namespace. Yeah, right. And they cannot take over it anymore. Yeah. But doing that, I, I've done a load test for that. Mm. And I'm seeing like, the CPU on the master nodes is going through the rooftop because the more customization you have, the more tenants you have, you have to create service accounts. And you, when you create a cluster from scratch, if you have like, let's say 100 apps, I've tried it with 100 and each has its own uh, namespace, its own service account that's not in that namespace, it's in the system namespace. Um, yeah, yeah so you avoid that situation where you're having to create a service account just to have that restriction. So yeah. So if you can create users instead that avoid no, you don't create users. That that's the beauty of users. You don't have to create it. A user yeah. it's All right. it's, it's just a label. It's just oh, a label. Right, right. Yeah. So it's not a yeah. All right. So you, you target you target it with a role binding or whatever and yes, with a role binding in that space, and that's it. So I, I really like that approach because it uh... Right. So so using users avoids that. Okay, so there's an alternative design that might avoid, potentially avoid some 
of the like having to have OPA rules to restrict things because you, if they can't create stuff, including service accounts outside of the namespace anyway, then tenants can't exploit the loophole. So you don't have to have any extra enforcement of rules. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that that'd be nice. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, the that's the plan. Um, I, I don't want to run with a fork of kubecaton in, in customized controllers, so we'll just delay this a little longer. We cannot release this this week. Um, yeah. even, okay. in, even when you're impersonating in the alternate design, you still need to impersonate a user anyway. So yeah, it, in some circumstances. So yeah, it still needs that fix. Yeah. So for now, we'll keep the, <clears throat> the service account and the only option to do multi-tenancy through uh, opening pull requests on the free triple to register everything. And or one being have... very... <laughs> what? Or being very, very careful. Yeah. And creating service accounts in the right yes. way. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and yeah, once we have that patch upstream, we can um, switch to the user impersonation and um, create a, a guide on how we can, as a cluster admin, how we can provision namespaces with users. And after that, the only responsibility of a platform admin is to onboard the tenant repository and not each app repository on its own, yeah. which makes the job way easier. Um, uh, to jot down that alternate design. Is it, there's a discussion on this somewhere, isn't there? Yes. OK, I'll try and find it. And just jot down what we were just talking about. Yeah, so and another thing that uh, I have implemented uh, last evening for for the customized controller, and um, hopefully we could at some point we'll able to get it in, in hand controller, um, is the option to mount uh, a cube config from um, created by Cappy. So, when you have a cluster API uh, provider, after it creates a cluster, it will create a secret with the cube config of that particular cluster. Yep. And That's what um, is. now the in the customization object, you can refer a cube config in the namespace of the customization. So if you are not a cluster admin, you don't have access to the Capy uh, namespace. So it's impossible to use that particular uh, cube config because we don't allow cross namespace secret references. Uh, but a cluster admin can create a Git repository and a customization and the cluster definition in the repo, in the fleet repo. It commits that. Customized control will apply the cluster definition. Then it will wait for that particular uh, cube config to be created. Once the cube config is created, that means the remote cluster is up and running, and it connects to that cluster and applies whatever is in that particular repo. And what I think it should be in that particular repo is the toolkit manifests themselves. So customized controller first will apply the Cluster definition, the cluster gets created, then it applies the toolkit definition. And from that moment on, that particular cluster can live on its own and reconcile its own state uh, because it has the toolkit there, uh, the fleet repo provisions, the Git repo, and the tenants Git repos, and all this stuff on that particular cluster. And from then, that cluster does its own thing. Yeah. Yeah, I thought about bootstrapping when I was messing around with this stuff as well. And it is, I mean, there's so many ways you could do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's so many ways that it can get done wrong, I think. So like, for instance, one thing I thought of is, um, you know, if you have, say, a uh, bootstrap definition, which says, you know, go and get the uh, sort of base syncing mechanism config from here. So this is this is the bit you're referring to of installing TK toolkit. Um, and then because you know later you might want to go and upgrade that. Right? Of course. Um, and then I thought, well, 
but what if you just refer to some random other Git repo? <laughs> then it just that will totally not work. So I got slightly stuck around that, those questions. I mean, yeah, people are always going to do something funny. Maybe you just give them access to a version rather than the thing, but the you know the the Git URL or something. But um, it's very chicken and egg, obviously. Yeah. The, the <clears throat> The use case I have in mind is you have a, in the fleet repository, you provision clusters and tenants repos that have to be reconciled on those remote clusters. And what the customized controller that runs on the management cluster, the only thing it does, it applies the toolkit definitions, it applies the Git repo and the customization for the tenant repo, and then the tenant is the owner of that cluster and can do whatever they want in their own repo. So the use case I have in mind doesn't work for everybody. It's not the golden rule of managing uh, fleets, but it's one option. And I think many will be happy with it. Uh, the implementation was fairly simple. Um, there is no future like we uh, customize control on the manager cluster will not do rolling upgrades, between clusters and so on, you decide what gets shipped on every single cluster and every single cluster is totally dependent from the management cluster once the toolkit is installed there. What you can do as a fleet admin is upgrade the toolkit itself on all your uh, uh, clusters in the fleet. That's the only thing that you can do, but you cannot you know, deploy an app or say, hey, I want to move this app for this cluster. Yeah. That other blah, blah, blah. Yeah. yeah, there are yeah. many, many things here. I I don't think customized control should be doing any of that. I think if if something has to do rolling upgrades across clusters and stuff like that, it should be some specialized component. Um, in my mind, customized control and helm control should be able to target a remote cluster if they have the right cube config, apply some stuff there, and that's it. Um, yeah, so the, all the machinery and what little there is in Starling is is about doing exactly that stuff. And it does it in almost exactly the way you describe. It goes looking for the Kuba config secret. When it sees a cluster, it looks for the Kuba, Kuba config secret and syncs to that cluster directly. Yeah. Um, but I don't think I did it that way because it was easy. I, I didn't. Well, we had this discussion quite a long time ago about you don't really want to do all your thinking that way because it's the single point of failure. Yeah. So I think it works for the case where you're just trying to get something up and running, which can then be largely self-sufficient. Yeah, this is, why I, this is thinking about as bootstrapping. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for for this particular future, you'll be using the fleet repository to install the toolkit itself. And from that moment on, that particular cluster is linked to a repo and you do whatever you do through that repo that has dedicated customized control, source control on the cluster. If the um, management cluster goes down, there is no issue. Uh, but yeah. well, you cannot do rolling upgrades through all the fleet. So that's a different, totally different discussion. <laughs> What I found was once you start introducing that sort of stuff, you you can't think of that. It's just too much stuff to think about, and you, you will never arrive at a design. So it's much better to say, forget about that stuff, just get something, um, and then think about it later on its own. Yeah. Um, the, the main use case is, hey, I want to get a new cluster with the toolkit already provisioned on it and ready to sync from a repo. Uh, that's yeah, um, that's the, what we achieve here. Sorry, yeah. Um, the, there's that whole um, cluster resource thing, which is sort of interesting. Have you, so in cluster API, the I, I don't know what stage it's up to, but the idea is there will be a controller which does that, but not in a GitOps way. So yeah, I know. Here is the yeah. button, splat that into. Each cluster as it comes up. Yeah, it's a is the post post cluster creation webhook. Yeah, yeah, and it's a 
event based system. I'm don't oh, no, no an, an extra thing, but doing a similar job. Yeah, Lee showed it to me. Like it's uh, yeah, it it applies stuff after you create a cluster. Like I don't know, it sets up with net. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's it right. Modifies core DNS and adds some plugins or. It does the stuff we were talking about, except it doesn't do it from Git. Yeah. Define it. What, what I'm I'm trying to do is not deal with cluster add-ons in any way. What I'm trying to say is, hey, I want to create a new cluster now and onboard this particular tenant, that particular repository, and give them full access to the cluster through their own Git repo without any kind of kubectl uh, access to the cluster itself. And this is what what we can achieve with uh, with the toolkit today, uh, today. Well, after we release zero one, <laughs> it's going to be a long day. Today. In a very, very loose sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and um, after after the release, uh, I'm guessing we should focus on uh, docs and decide uh, a way forward for um, Helm operator users. I will prioritize that. Um, Switch into in mode. Yeah, V2 is off in November, no longer supported. Uh, so we can, I don't know, CVs, all this stuff for Helm operator are, are not going to be possible. Uh, so yeah. Uh, having good docs on how you can migrate from Helm operator to toolkit, uh, I think should be the number one priority. And the number two priority should be Flux read-only users because there are so many Flux users that are relying on the image update component and we don't have uh, something from them now. So I think, yeah, helping the Helm users first makes sense. We have 100% future parity Sounds and any other futures. <laughs> On top of what Helm operator uh, did, so yeah, yeah. It's a straightforward thing, and like you can just upgrade the Helm operator to Helm controller and leave other stuff alone. So I think so. If you can do that, then they can be prioritized because it seems yeah. urgent, doesn't it? Yeah, and we because we changed the um, uh, the group name is not the same group name as we have for Helm release version one, you can migrate from Helm, Helm release version one to Helm release version two gradually. So you can run in parallel Helm operator and Helm controller port one by one. And when you are ready, when everything is ported, then you can uh, you know, delete the uh, Helm operator deployment and its custom resource. So we for for those that are having like hundreds of Helm releases and we have many users doing that, we cannot tell them, hey, you need to upgrade in in a single shot. So uh, we did a similar thing, I think, at one point in Helm operators history. Yeah. Yeah, when we move from WeWorks group domain to the uh, Flux CDIO group domain, it was the, the similar. You could run the, the two things in parallel, of course. Because, yeah, I have a feeling we did it earlier on as well, and it was sort of upgrading to 1.0 or something like that, and because it worked. I think we did it for the 1.5 release or something. Okay. I can actually look it up because we have the docs from the previous uh, migration guide. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Anyway, it went quite smoothly, so it's, I think it's a good idea. Yeah, the main difference now is so before you would add your Helm repository things in a YAML and that YAML you have to mount it in Helm operator, you have to put the secrets inside the YAML, the authentication and everything. Uh, yes. If you want to add or remove a repository, you have to redeploy the whole thing. So now you can just create this Helm repository custom resources. So it's way easier to migrate from one to another um, because we no longer deal with yeah. mounting files and anything like that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, uh, we'll 
try to get zero one out today. Um, tomorrow morning I'll be off a little and I'll come back in the evening. I'm traveling to a different city. Okay. So I don't need your laptop to, to get fixed in Germany. Is that what? Yeah, my, um, Daniel got the laptop today. He sent me a picture. It looks okay. He's no longer <laughs> exploded. Uh, yeah, we'll see next week. He will send it to me and I'll see if it works. I hope so. <laughs> it took a month almost. So, yeah, good thing I had a backup. A friend gave me a backup laptop. Cool. All right. Uh, I don't think we have, we shouldn't start any new topics. Four minutes to go. So, shall we stop there? Yep. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Hida. See ya. Bye bye.